All right. Welcome back, everybody. It's been an exciting day so far, so I'm excited for Heat 3. So let's uh, jump back into it then. Um, I'm going to introduce our first participant. So up first, we have Marie Abu Itham pursuing a Master's of Health Sciences in Kinesiology, presenting parent perceptions of the active play behaviors of their 4 to 11-year-old twins and triplets with autism. Marie loves how qualitative research gives the opportunity to collect the stories that people carry of their experiences and considers it a privilege to present these narratives in a way that honors them and adds knowledge to the field of re to her field of research. Welcome, Marie. All right, are we good to go? Right, sorry, yes, <laughs> perfect. Okay, Thank you. So oh, no. much. <laughs> okay, are you all set? Yep. Okay, take it away. Okay, I want you to think about someone who means a lot to you in your life. Is it your brother, your partner, your child? Picture them in your mind. Now think about a time you spent with them where you felt really connected with them. Were you camping, playing soccer? Okay, now stretch your brain a little bit to think about how a parent of a child with autism might connect with their child. Now you might not know a lot about autism spectrum disorder, but in general, these are individuals who show differences in the way they communicate, behave, and engage socially. One of the most important things to know about kids with autism is that there's a spectrum. If you've met one kid with autism, you've met one kid with autism. Well, we interviewed nine mothers of twins and triplets where each child in the sibling group had autism. Our main goal was to hear how they described their kids' physically active play. This is play where kids use total body movements to expend their energy in the way that they are choosing because it's fun. Think climbing on a jungle gym or playing tag. The benefit of talking to parents of twins and triplets with autism is that you have a unique opportunity to zero in on the kids' active play behaviors because you can control for factors like uh, age or access to play equipment. And what we find particularly interesting is that despite all their similarities, parents consistently talked about how their kids played so differently. One mother talked about how her daughter loves to move and move well. She loves rock climbing because she loves that feeling of climbing the wall, but also the sense of accomplishment of getting to the top. Her twin brother, on the other hand, loves to play with other kids. And while he himself isn't really into physical touch, he'll run around and wrestle with them if that's what they want to do. Another participant talked about how her twins play at completely different speeds. Her daughter is always go, 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 running, dancing, swinging, and her son moves more slowly, checking things out. The truth is, is that these types of descriptions of kids with autism playing are actually quite rare in the literature. Most research just compares how kids with autism play differently from neurotypical kids, um, often focusing on what they don't do rather than describing what they do. On top of parents describing their kids' play, they also repeatedly talked about how watching their children play allowed them more access to relate to their child. And so here's why this is important. Active play is often used by clinicians in structured therapist-led sessions to teach daily living skills, and these are good goals to have. Our participants talked about specific ways that these types of sessions help their kids learn skills like taking turns or following directions. However, our research suggests that parents also value unstructured, child-led uh, active play experiences for their kids with autism. Parents talked about intentionally carving out times like this for their kids to make their own decisions during free play. According to our results, parents find this time valuable not only because they sense their kids need it, but because it gives them a window into their children's world. These results suggest that active play holds tremendous value for kids with autism, regardless of what their play may look like. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marie. Okay, uh, we'll give the judges a few moments with their scorecards. Okay, I'm going to introduce our next participant. We have Cassandra Dion uh, Le Riviere. I tried to practice that, <laughs> pursuing a master's of science in forensic psychology, presenting Smile for the Webcam, the effects of rapport building on information disclosure in virtual interviews. Cassandra is from a rural town near Quebec City and completed a BA honors in applied psychology at Bishop's University in Quebec. Welcome, Cassandra. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> All set? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Someone has been the victim of a serious crime something like a sexual assault. Now they're coming forward to talk to the police in detail about the most difficult thing they've ever been through. Not only is this already going to be challenging, but it's only amplified by the fact that it has to happen over Zoom. Is it still possible to have a meaningful conversation about such a serious topic in a virtual context? This has been something that has taken place regularly across the world since March of 2020. 
police officers have been interviewing victims and witnesses on online platforms, just like Zoom and Google Meets. These interviews are often the only source of information that the police can rely on to further their criminal investigations. They are extremely important, but they're often challenging for everyone involved. And that's where rapport building comes in. Rapport building involves making efforts to build a working relationship with the person being interviewed by doing things like personalizing the interview, presenting an approachable demeanor, and engaging in and demonstrating active listening. What happens, however, when many of the behaviors that would typically help build rapport are no longer possible when you're sitting from across the screen? No handshakes, no direct eye contact, no leaning forward, no offering a glass of water, no control over the environment's safety. Officers are taught to avoid interrupting the victim's account, but what happens when the connection is unstable? In my master's research, we sought to examine this. We showed 94 student participants a sexual education video to replicate a difficult to discuss topic. Essentially, asking participants to tell us everything that they could remember about this video meant that they had to describe female and male genitalia as well as sexual intercourse to a stranger over Zoom. And I can tell you that most of our participants agreed that it was awkward to talk about. We conducted two types of interviews for this study. One based on a rapport building approach where we smiled, nodded as they spoke, asked them about themselves and also told them a little bit about ourselves. For the second type of interview, based on a no rapport building approach, we were indifferent, officious, and more straightforward. We found that participants spoke more words and thus showed a greater willingness to talk about the awkward topic in the interviews where we built rapport. They also gave us more accurate information and more overall pieces of information. Police have to continue having these difficult conversations online every single day. And our research suggests that it's possible for them to both have meaningful and effective conversations under the following condition that they still make efforts to build rapport with the victims and witnesses they speak to, despite the challenges imposed by the online format. In an applied context where every single piece of information matters and where the victims and witnesses accounts is all that the police often have, this can directly translate to justice for victims and their loved ones. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Okay, we'll give the judges a few moments with their scorecards. I'm going to introduce our next participant. We have Abbas Ajorkar pursuing a PhD in mechanical engineering, presenting autonomous driving control of vehicles. So Abbas's interests include mountain climbing, reading, watching films, and calligraphy. So welcome. Um, how are you? Thank you. Good. Good. Um, and you're all ready to go? Yep, sure. Oh, sounds great. Okay, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, have you ever seen a car accident in which somebody is injured seriously? Well, I hope you've never seen, but in reality, I want to mention that despite the development of vehicle safety features over the past decades, the traffic accident still kills millions of lives on the road all around the world, unfortunately. But what do you think about the main reasons? By analyzing data from camera-equipped vehicles, several studies have estimated that driver distraction contributes to 50% of all crashes. Wow, that's too much. In this regard, development of an autonomous driving control system, ADCS, autonomous driving control system, is an effective and wider approach towards driving safety. My name is Abbas. I am a first year PhD student and my research focus is on ADCS. Now, before addressing the ADCS, I should mention that there are six levels of automation, starting from level zero, which means no automation, to level five, which means full automation. In addition, the current cars on the road, such as Tesla, with such a huge amount of facilities, fall between level two and level three. So there is a long path to full automation, I mean level four, which means driver can even sleep during driving. A fantasy, enjoyable, and safe imagination. Let's come back to the ADCS. ADCS has the task to steer, I mean control the vehicle automatically toward the right position and attitude. So far, different controllers have been proposed for using ADCS, and MPC is one of the newest. 
If you are wondering what is MPC, it stands for Model Predictive Controller. MPC, Model Predictive Controller. MPC is a double-edged sword. Although it's robust to external disturbances on the road, and it has the ability to predict vehicle status for the future use, is slow and time-consuming. Now, as a team member, I'm doing my best to design an applicable and agile MPC for the ADCS and test it, I mean validate it, on the lab simulator. I know this is a long task, but I hope take small steps toward decreasing number of death in vehicle accidents. Much coin, much care. Thank you. Thank you, Abbas. Okay, the judges are now going to take a few moments with their scorecards. Okay, I'm now going to introduce our next participant. We have Emmeline Means Miller, pursuing a Master's of Health Sciences in Kinesiology, presenting identifying salivary cytokines tokens associated with prolonged sitting. Emmeline is a member of the Varsity Women's Rowing Team and is from Curtis, Ontario. Emmeline enjoys the outdoors, traveling, sports, coaching, gymnastics, and has two golden retrievers named Bo and Archie. Welcome, Emmeline. Thank you. All right. Hello. Are we good to get started? Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Emmeline Means Miller, and I'm a first year master's student in kinesiology in the Faculty of Health Science. My research focuses on the effects of too much sitting. Who here feels like they're doing a lot of sitting these days? We're spending more time than ever before sitting at our desks, at our laptops, and in our homes. Data indicates that Canadians spend up to 40% of their day sedentary. Now I've gone ahead and done a bit of math for you to put this into perspective. With the average Canadian spending 9.5 hours per day sitting, if you were to live to 80 years old, you would spend a total of 31.68 years seated. Now that's a lot of sedentary time. High volumes of sedentary time have been linked with poor health outcomes, including increased risk of chronic disease, such as diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, as well as increased risk of obesity, weight gain, high blood pressure, and here's where I come in, chronic low-grade inflammation. Here's the thing. Research shows a clear link between all of those diseases I mentioned, early death, and chronic low-grade inflammation. But if we move, we can actually reduce our low-grade inflammation. The issue is most of us aren't moving enough. So how much do you need to move in order to bring that low-grade inflammation down? That's exactly what I would like to answer. In my study, we have participants complete a baseline exercise test and provide a saliva sample that we use to test for inflammatory markers. They then complete two sessions in random order. One session is a prolonged sitting session where they sit with, for four hours with no interruption. We literally wheel people to the bathroom. And the other session is an interrupted sitting session. So they sit for four hours, but every 30 minutes, we interrupt it with three minutes of moderate intensity walking. Saliva samples from the beginning and end of these sessions will be compared. The most novel aspect of my research is how we're collecting the samples. So using saliva rather than blood and what we're doing with those samples. Saliva is an easy to collect bodily fluid that tells us loads of information about our physiology. In this case, it can tell us how our bodies respond to sitting and to moving. We will be using microarray kits to test small volumes of saliva for dozens of different inflammatory markers. We hope to identify which markers have the greatest response to small volumes of movement. Now, how many of you are hoping that three minutes of walking every half hour is going to prevent you from getting tons of different chronic diseases? Well, we hope so too, but you'll have to stay tuned for results. In the meantime, let's err on the side of caution and start moving a little bit more. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Okay, we'll give the judges a few moments with their scorecards. Okay, I'm going to introduce um, our final participant for Heat 3. Um, Stacy, thank you for, <laughs> for going last and hanging on to the very end. Um, so Stacy Kernief is um, 
pursuing a master's of science in computer science and will be presenting Run Llama Run, a collaborative physical and online coding game for children. Stacy completed her undergraduate degree in computer science at Ontario Tech University. Outside of school, Stacy can often be found reading, painting, or playing music. Welcome, Stacy. Hi, may I begin? Hi, absolutely. Go ahead. Great, thank you. So hello, my name is Stacy Cornafe, and today I would like to talk with you about Run Llama Run, a collaborative physical and online coding game for children. So computer science is becoming more popular in schools and in the job market. But not everyone has regular access to a computer, which makes it a little hard to learn computer science. So we've created a collaborative game for kindergarten, kindergarten through grade five students that doesn't need a computer. So there are actually two versions of the game. There's a hybrid physical and online version, as well as a completely physical version. And both of them use the physical blocks that you can see in the top right picture. So these blocks can actually be printed either on paper or with a 3D printer, which allows for multiple ways to access the material. So the hybrid game, which can kind of be seen on the bottom left picture, is actually uh, provides students with a online app that they'll work together using those physical blocks to develop a solution to a bunch of problems. So in this case, a llama needs to go get a key. So you can actually see people playing the game in the top left corner. So once the students are able to find their solution with the blocks, they actually take a picture. And then this actually uploads the blocks from the physical space into the digital app. And then they're able to click Run Llama Run and watch the code go through each step of those blocks. And then if there's a problem, the uh, app actually gives them a error message and lets them know where they might be going wrong with a couple hints. And then they're able to repeat this as many times as possible as they need to complete the pro problem. So they're able to learn. Now I also mentioned that there's a physical version which can be seen on the bottom right. So this uses paper printed problem cards which are the same problems from the app. And it also uses little paper object disks which is a llama and a key so that the students have something to interact with. And it also uses those physical blocks so my personal favorite way to play this, so there's many different ways of playing this, is actually to split students into two groups. And the first group actually works to create the solution with the blocks. Well, the second group, once the solution is created, actually goes through each step and moves that little llama object disk to be able to go through it. Now, there might be a problem. And in that case, we encourage students to actually work together to figure out a solution. So with this, the students learn both coding and how the coding works from the computer side and how the code would run. And they also learn how to work together. So this game is actually designed for equitable access and the game is free and only needs a one-time access to a computer to print the uh, objects. So my next step is to study this game in a classroom with students and I'm really excited to see where it goes. And I'd like to thank you all for listening today. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, the judges will now uh, take a few moments for their score sheets. All right, thank you so much to all of our participants from Heat 3. You all did a great job and can take a, a breath of relief. Um, so we are going to now have our deliberation period. Um, okay, so thank you everyone and we'll see you back at 12 o'clock. Okay, welcome back everybody. Exciting, exciting. Um, I would like to uh, just take a moment to thank all of the participants, staff, and judges uh, who make the um, event possible. And we hope to continue to see this event grow each year and showcase the innovative research happening here. Um, an extra special thank you to our participants. You did it, you can all breathe now. <laughs> you made us so proud with your hard work and your dedication to both this competition and your research. Um, these past few months have required countless hours of workshops, coaching, and practicing just for three short minutes, um, you put your research in the spotlight and made our community proud. So the moment we've all been waiting for, I'm just going to introduce uh, again our bronze, bronze sponsor judge, Larkin Mosscroft from uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories to announce our finalists. Thank you. I also get to be put on the spot of pronouncing names. So um, I just wanted to say uh, this event was great. Um, I really love participating in this event and getting to see all the new research and what people are working on. And I think that three minutes is such a great way to kind of think about the elevator pitch of what you do and, and what 
and this will kind of help you throughout your whole career in terms of teaching and talking about kind of what you're looking at or what you're interested in. So I think it's such a great event and I'm happy to be here. And now you don't want to hear about that. You want to hear who gets to move on. So, okay. Um, the first, so we, we had a great time judging. No, you want me to keep going. Okay. The first person um, that we'll have, and not in any order of ranking or anything, I'm just going to say all six finalists with no order. Um, the first is Danielle Bates. Congratulations. Second is Mir Afghan Talpur. Third is Anna Espinoza. Fourth is Kavian Kosra Vinyo. <laughs> uh, fifth is Cassandra Diandachrivi. And six is Emmeline Means Miller. Congratulations, everyone. Um, every one of the participants blew us away. We were very excited to participate and to judge. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing these uh, finalists participate tomorrow. Oh, well, so exciting. Um, huge congratulations to all of our finalists and just congratulations all around. Um, again, be so proud of yourselves. And I really hope the experience of participating in 3MT has sort of built a skill set in you where you can use going forward, as Larkin had said, just in your academic and professional careers. Um, so thank you everyone for attending today's heats. Um, thanks again to our judges um, and congratulations again to all participants and finalists. Um, so be sure to tune into our finals live stream tomorrow happening at 2 30 p.m. to cheer on all of your colleagues. Um, such a pleasure, everyone. Uh, thank you again.